from Galvanize, San Francisco, extracting signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering the Apache Spark community event, brought to you by IBM. Now your hosts, John Furry and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in San Francisco, winding down the day here. What a day, big day today it's been. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my host, George Gilbert, our big data analyst at Wikibon. And we're here on the ground in San Francisco live for the IBM Special Edition CUBE for the Spark Community event in conjunction with Spark Summit where all the action is going on, where all the thought leaders and now mainstream is looking at Spark as that next innovation, that disruptive enabler that's creating a lot of opportunity. And our next guest to break it down for us is, is Paco Nathan, training director at Databricks, O'Reilly Media consultant, uh, in the trenches, been involved in data for decades, and now we're in a new era of data. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, John. Thank you, George. Appreciate great, saw your panel up there in front of the live audience downstairs. It was great, we're here at the Galvanize workspace incubator education space, however it evolves. Yeah. Either way, developers are everywhere. You're seeing startups here. Um, Absolutely. IBM announcing their support for Spark throws a huge endorsement to the community and also to customers as a, as a way to telegraph what's next. And this has implications. So I want to get your thoughts. First question is, you know, well, you've been involved in Spark for, for a long time. You've been there from the beginning. You've been seeing it evolve. What's going on? What's happening? Why is IBM doing this? Well, I mean, it's really clear when we take a look at the use cases when we're out there in the field that Spark is a game changer. I mean, it's, it's allowing more of the, the business customer inside of a, an organization to get hands on with the data, get something useful right out of it. And at the end of the day, that's what you need. So I got to ask you, you know, we, you know, being in the 30 years in the enterprise business, software business, and entre entrepreneur, I've seen the waves come and go. Client <laughs> server created a great gravy train. Sure. Certainly TCP IP was in a disruptive enabler back in the day, created networking and all that wealth. Now, the enterprises have been consolidating over the past two decades, cut costs, cut down to the bone, outsource everything. And all of a sudden with cloud, just in the past five years or so, now invest. So all of a sudden you're anemic, and now you've got to be explosively strong like Superman. It's hard. So I want to get your take as someone is out and talking to customers. This is a challenge, because some enterprises are like, okay, I'm lean, mean, operational, sure. I've cut costs, we're running, the, keeping the lights on, and now they're asked to um, invest more. Then on the other end, you've got financial services, the big spenders, they've been doing it for, for a long time, they still invest. But that enterprise dilemma is, what do I do? What do I do now? This new innovation, what's the roadmap? So I think a lot of the spark adoption that I've seen is about mitigating risk. I mean, we, we were cutting back in IT because these projects are enormous, they're huge, they cost a lot of money, they don't always pay off. The thing that's different with Spark is you can get right in and get your hands on the data and prove what you need to prove. And when it's time to scale it up, it's very simple to scale it up. So there's a lot less risk to say, I'm going to embark on this path and it's going to take me nine months before I know yay or nay. Yeah. You can instead get that back in nine minutes. And I think that's the game changer. You know, this whole Spark thing and cloud mobile socialist innovation past, you know, a couple, five years has been really exciting. Sure. Reminds me of the Steve Jobs 1984 commercial <laughs> where the drones are walking, this is against IBM ironically at the time, <laughs> running, walking off the cliff. And that is essentially what the enterprise has been like. But yeah. now all of a sudden, the people close to the action People in the field, the data scientists, in the past have been indifferent for innovating because the hurdles, yeah, the sure. friction to go back into the data warehouse and the business intelligence the systems, the they're all fenced off, yeah. the schema, it's a, it's a train wreck in terms of innovation, it's friction, it's so they think, they, I'm going to go home. But now, with the agile nature of Spark, sure. People close to the action can be creative. The hackathons are booming. They had 28,000 at IBM. They had one this weekend. And just the innovation is just amazing. So I wanted to get your perspective. That excites people. Because now people can feel, I can contribute. The money balls you kicked around all the time with the baseball analogy. But what does that really mean? What is, what's going on in the field relative to this new dynamic of creativity with data? Sure, well, I mean, one thing is there's a lot of data that we're just, we're, we're surrounded by it. If you take a look, like flying in here, into the airport, I'm on some large airliner. <laughs> and you know the name names, it probably uh, was not that good. Yeah, yeah. It was a good you know, line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so a nice statistic there, you take a look at, at GE and the other vendors who, who provide those turbines. Uh, there's one sensor just to watch the bearings on those turbines. And currently, for all the commercial aircraft in flight, it generates 12 exabytes a day. 
And there's no way that we can just take and store that. I actually heard a conversation from a particular vendor about, can you help us put that in the cloud? Are you saying it's one exabyte just for the sensors and all the engines? 12. Just for the, 12. For the bearings? Just for the bearings. And that's just for commercial aircraft. Wow. If we start thinking about trains and trucks and autos and all this, we're swimming in data, and most of it we're ignoring. But there's a lot of things we could be doing really good. You know, I mean, especially with, with transportation. I, I started out on this. Yeah, I mean, the cost savings are in the billions. Yeah. I mean, I mean, enterprises, you see hundreds of millions when you get to transportation, whether it's, you know, railroads and or other transportation is in the billions. Um, Puck, I want to get your thoughts on the creative thing. I love this creative thing because it remind, reminds me of that old movie. I don't can date myself with this. Contact with Jodie uh -huh. uh, Foster. That little data point that's an outlier can be opened up now and, and innovation can come from that. So we're seeing data science now explore these new capabilities that were once kind of like, well, I got a provision a data center. <laughs> What is the impact of the customer? What's the mindset of people that you've worked with sure. that have been successful looking at everything in real time, maybe it's passive data and active data in real time, but when those outliers are out there, those are the new potential signals that could shift a company's trajectory. Sure, well, you know, for, for a long time, we've thought about data. When we want to go and do some kind of modeling, maybe customer segmentation for marketing, you want to take and get a sample of your data and make your models. Um, we're past that now. Number one, the data is too large to really sample it effectively. So it's good to be able to do your training at scale. If you have 100 million customers, why not work with the data for 100 million customers directly and come up with segments, not just two or three, but maybe you need 10 or 20 or 100. Um, Spark is opening up the ability to get in and treat the data. And what are the consequences? I want to get that, because that was a great example. So in order to do that 10 years ago, yeah. compare and contrast that scenario because back then you'd have to do some panels, oh. you had to do some statistical calculations, and then say, well, based on the correlation, now you're saying essentially everything's instrumentable. Why not use that data? So that's what you said, if I get that exactly. right. Exactly, why not go directly? So compare and contrast, what would it <laughs> cost? Order of magnitude, you know, the, not the number, but close enough, like 10 years ago to today. Well, you know, it's- Speed it's, and as well as deployment. It, it's time. I think deployment, you really hit on the head there. It's mostly about time. It's it, the opportunity cost, and you take a look at how the likelihood of it working trails off over time. <laughs> Uh, if you've got to write a PRD and an ERD and it's going to be yeah. six months before you get your first confirmation, uh, who knows if it's going to work. Yeah. But and depending on the scope, that number can, can vary. Sure, for, for enterprise. You said something interesting earlier about sort of risk mitigation in, in the apps that started in the use cases that rather than the traditional big bang for the old systems of record, right. you sort of inventory your data and you inventory the functionality that you want to go after, you carve off a small piece. Um, today, though, you, st you still need to be data scientist, you know, at the programming level or a data developer and data modeling level. Are notebooks or s GUI tools going to empower more people to at least get the process started or to help with the process? I, I really believe that, that notebooks are as fundamental a change as, I'm going to date myself, uh, back when we saw spreadsheets being introduced. I mean, I, I was a programmer working in finance. I worked at Lotus. Yeah. had a summer job. The, the last year, we were bigger than Microsoft in revenues, 86. It was such a game change. And, and I think that we're seeing this now with notebooks because it speaks to collaboration of teams. It speaks to people who aren't necessarily programmers collaborating with other people who are. So, you know, when I think about putting together a data science team, I know that I've got to have somebody doing the cluster. IBM is really good at doing those clusters, by the way. Um, somebody's writing some code, but the other people are working on the analysis level, you know, the business analysts, data scientists. There's other people who are stakeholders, right? They represent the business. If you're in finance, you have to know the regulations. You have to know how to play the game. Same thing if you're in yeah. pharma, same thing if you're in transportation. You have to have that business knowledge as well. So you can't just imagine that all these different roles are going to sit there in their, their yeah. IDEs and write code and it's going to magically work. Notebooks, on the other hand, being there in a browser, I think it allows a wider range of people to engage, but it's that team context, really contextualizing the business problem. That's what it solves. And also separation from the infrastructure. Yeah. By decoupling that, it takes the provisioning out of it. It's also the speed. No one feels like they're moving mountains to get something provisioned if it doesn't work out. So like, I think that whole infrastructure separation, which developers like, because they don't want to deal with the infrastructure sure, sure. guys, right? Sure. I mean, it, it's possible you could try to move mountains, but the fact is, this is more likely to work. Yeah. So there's a, there's a likelihood that people will go after tougher, tougher problems then. Can I just want to circle back to 
Well, there's one thing that, that John said where the notebooks are sort of like, since they're developer-oriented, it's really like PaaS, you know, IBM Bluemix would serve up this PaaS capability, potentially. But I also, or, or, or I guess you could look at it as SAS, you know, for, for data science as well, but I wanted to ask if you could help us visualize the notebooks a little bit, oh, sure. where, you know, what would the data modeler, you know, data developer do, and how would he collaborate with the data scientist sure. and the business analyst? Well, you know, if I'm, if I'm building some kind of a data product, if I've got a team that's it's got a pipeline that they're responsible for, or some set of apps like that, um, there's always the work to pull in from different data sources. You know, you've got some big data, you've got some structured data, you've got some metadata to put it together, et cetera. Um, there's always going to be a lot of ETL. You're going to have to clean up that data. You listen to DJ Patil, who's now the chief data scientist, right? First time in the history of the government, <laughs> data scientist in the White House. Cheers, DJ cheers Patel. To DJ. Yes, uh, you know, and he talks about a Pareto ratio, right? 80-20 rule. You spend 80% of your time and your money cleaning up the data over and over and over. And so that's where these notebooks really simplify that. And there's people bringing it together. But then once you have your data, then you can start to explore. So you're saying that they can help in the ETL process? Exactly. Because they, it, they visualize it and they can even apply some machine learning techniques. The nice thing with the notebooks is you've got these different cells. It's basically like a, a big stack of cells. And a cell could be a piece of code or it could be some documentation. Think of it. Or not even documentation. It could be HTML that embeds video. Maybe it's a YouTube clip. Um, so you've got some, you know, you've got your code that you need to work with that's pointing out to your data, but you've also got some notes or some instructions, some explanation, and then you've got other cells that are the results. So it could be that your code is generating a dashboard for the execs to look at, um, and it's right there, it's right in context. This is, I guess I've missed this, but having been in a spreadsheet company, this was the dream of the visual, <laughs> exactly. visual development environment. Exactly, yeah. That I mean, I'm not going to ask why, why it took us 20 more years to get there. <laughs> but so, but let, me, let me back you up into, you talked about the ETL side, so that would, might be the data modeler who's doing some visualization. So once he's got a view of the data that makes sense to him, what does he hand off to the data scientist, and what does it look like to them? So you know, downstream, the data scientist may be doing some unsupervised learning to take a look at you know, what's really the structure, get in and do some complex visualizations, some clustering, look at the clusters, more than what you would typically do as an analyst. Um, but really downstream from there, you typically want to do predictive analytics, right, modeling. And so that's where the machine learning tools come in. And the nice thing is that with Spark and with these notebooks, so far I've described about 10 lines of code. I mean, the machine learning models, you can get in and set up your feature vectors and run the model in a couple of lines of code, maybe another three lines of code to evaluate the results. And so you, you take a look at having a pretty broad range of people across these teams, hands-on, all in the different cells in the notebook, and you just run the whole thing and you, know, you get your yeah, it's results. Not a lot, it's not a lot of code. I mean, no. you have the data sets available. It's almost like the way SQL was in the 80s. Well, you know, it's a really simple way to extract data. Not you don't have to be a super duper badass backend developer, C programmer. That's a that's a really good point. Actually, what we're doing with Spark, the the new innovation coming out of 1.3 and now further in 1.4, is about data frames. And the idea is that as we move up higher levels of abstraction, we use data frames, which means you're writing SQL. Yeah. And by virtue of having that, Spark can do smarter things with optimizing code under the hood. But and it's have to flexible as well. It's just not a SQL-like in the sense of its ease. But there's also some other options, right, with exactly. Spark. You what are some of those things that you're giving in use cases? You know, you can get into it with functional programming. At the end of the day, there's yeah. functional programming below, yeah. and there's great reasons I won't go off a deep <laughs> end. You can also get into it with R, because R fits this very well. A lot of people know yeah. how to use R. Great yeah. visualizations, yeah. Python, et cetera. A lot of the kids coming out of college these days are all have R under their belt. That's Absolutely. what's in academia right now. Yeah. So that's a nice job market. I mean, you know, here I'm hearing some of the things IBM's doing at this immersion program in Galvanize. People making 120 grand a year coming out that's of like three great, month program. Great program. I'm, I'm an academic advisor for Galvanize. You are? So I'll put in a plug. Yes, excellent. Very, program. I'm very impressed. And they get the whole master's thing too, 12 months. Very, definitely. And, and not just San Francisco, but also Seattle and Denver yeah. as well. Yeah, I love it. So going back to um, replatforming, the way IBM replatformed, you know, the database, the web sphere, notes, all on top of Linux, essentially, you know, making, uh, sort of re-hosting and establishing um, Linux as a key enterprise platform. 
Um, we understood from some of the folks we interviewed today that bringing, you know, eventually SQL um, query optimizer, you know, in addition to the machine learning, streaming all richer uh, personalities on the Spark core. Right. Should we see the, um, should we expect to see IBM start building their own uh, notebooks? Or is that something that the Databricks guys are uniquely qualified for because they own, you know, the stack all the way down? How should we think about that? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, th so this is a big value prop for Databricks in terms of doing cloud-based notebooks. There's the Databricks cloud offering. And a lot of that is actually, uh, I should back up and say the Spark that you're using in Databricks Cloud is 100% open source, what you get right. from Apache. Um, it's actually the nuts and bolts of managing the cloud is a lot of the hard part that, that Databricks is providing as a service. And there is where, it's not just Linux, but over the top of Linux these days, more and more we're using containers. So doing something smart with containers in a cluster solution, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of the value that it brings. So that's op the operational value. Exactly, how to, how to really cut that risk for launching a new app without having to hire up a small army of ops people. But is there, are, are they gonna open source their tools? Would, I don't know if they've you know, done it or philosophically that's within you know, how they're thinking about it. Cause, so operationally it's clearly you know, making it simple to run a cluster is there's value in that, right, right. that's not open source. But um, would they keep the same tools development well, the nice thing is that, I mean, it, it's a 100% open source Spark, and then over the top of that, you've got Python and these great libraries like NumPy and SciPy that you can use, those are open. Uh, R, all the different libraries there you can bring in. SQL, yeah. everything you can bring in there. So as you move up the stack, it's much more op yeah. open. Uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of running the clusters, that's more proprietary, and I, I don't think it necessarily translate, but. Okay. Um, so Paco, just we're getting to Tight on time, it's ended a long day here. Um, I want to get your take on what you think is going to happen next. I mean, just kind of <laughs> let's speculate, because let's connect sure. the dots. Yeah. My favorite part of the, uh, the interview. IBM comes in, Spark's been kicking butt. It's been, we've been seeing, we were there at the first AMP lab, and then when Spark Summit, we were there uh, for the first one. Um, small, and then it gets bigger every year. It's like, what, this is the second year or third year? Uh, third year, third year. Yeah. Like doubled so, in size. So we've been time. here for all three years, um, just on the ground, kind of kicking around with Cloud Air and, and those guys. What's next? IBM right. has just basically shined a spotlight, Excellent. global spotlight on Spark, something that probably no one's ever heard of, <laughs> okay, outside of Silicon Valley and the, the geek community, right? This is going to open up a huge amount of visibility. What happens next? What, I mean, obviously, just it's going to be a huge amount of interest. Yeah. People are going to be flooded with questions. Events are going to happen. Community is going to grow. What's your take I mean, all on this? So I, I think the key phrase there is beyond Silicon Valley, outside of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of great companies here that are specialized in ad tech and social networks and, you know, these things we talk about in Silicon Valley all the time. Yeah. Uh, fraud is probably in there somewhere, e-commerce. Yeah. But when you get outside of Silicon Valley, there are real businesses doing real things. Yeah. And big and small, too. Big and small, absolutely, yeah. yeah. This, is not just all the big, this is not just for big big companies, right? It's market work great. Let's, let's go to Atlanta, and you have transportation. You have you know trans, uh, package delivery, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, you, you have large beverage manufacturers. You have all kinds of things. The whole Atlanta. world is, is, this is for all businesses. Exactly. This is for all businesses. And I think that's what this signals, is that it's not just about Silicon Valley and what we tend to focus on here. Yeah, the other thing that Rod Smith brought up from IBM, great guy, it's a fantastic uh, interview, he's historical perspective. He said something that was interesting to me. Custom analytics, this enables custom analytics. That was kind of his word, not that IBM's messaging, but he opens up the thing, well, okay, with verticals, you have domain expertise, a critical piece of sure. these vertical markets where big data's been thriving, you know, with analytics. People who are close to the action and have expertise are building whether they're ontologies and other algorithms. So now, with IBM on this, there's going to be a vertical expansion. This is going to create a custom analytics market, in our opinion. So what do you think about that? I mean, how does how does I say, I want some custom analytics. I'm an enterprise. I'm a transportation person. I have an IT. I'm, I, read, I read the blogs. I read the New York Times. I'm not in the inside baseball. What do I do? I'm an enterprise. How do I get involved? What's my next step? Well, I mean, there's a lot of hard problems in the enterprise. Supply chain, maintenance schedules, all kinds of routing problems, Spark works wonderfully for this. And that's what I've been going out and doing at part of my training is showing a lot of these, these kinds of industrial apps, whether you've got a railroad or whether you've got a bioinformatics problem, some pharma thing. 
Um, these are hard problems, and this is what the world runs and on. And they're being solved with Spark. Some people yes. are actually tackling these things, these new capabilities. And, and that's where I think the custom analytics comes in, because for a long time we've had the PhD students focused on yeah. making some better social network yeah. tweak. But now let's go after real problems. And with machine learning, you can actually get into some of these things where you had needed expertise in the past. Yeah. It opens it up a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Final question. Great. You don't have to be. You don't have to name names, but you just kind of give us a range, order, of magnitude, kind of like which solar system we're in. The biggest, in couple, couple examples of huge dollar savings from companies that have deployed big, good big data solutions where these companies have been full of data or data full, if you will, what I say is like, I'm full of data, I'm not a tool, I'm not, a, I'm not an apparatus or, or a software like some of the vendors in the industry, but I'm a company, I have a lot of data and I've done something and it's been a big money saver. Can you like, is it 100 million? What's the numbers you've seen that have been oh, the biggest? Numbers. You know, just, just a quote of <sighs> order of magnitude, like company X saved a billion dollars I mean, I talked to United Airlines on an interview with G sure. uh, 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 GE once, and the guy said we save over you know a billion dollars on fuel transport costs alone sure. with Internet of Things, and that was my highest number I heard. Sure. I, you know, I, as far as dollar values, I, I I stay more towards the use cases where they're talking about the data rates. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I I don't know that I could really quote the dollar values quite as much. Yeah. I, but I can do that as homework. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I I do see some pretty. But big there's some cases. transformative infrastructure. Yeah, things well, you've I, seen. I think I think some of the biggest is going to be in, in like cancer research, and and what we're seeing in medicine, where genomics is is yeah. a game changer, um, and yeah, it, it, that is billions and billions of dollars. Either right? way, we're totally doing the transformative market. You would agree? Yeah, absolutely. Bubble? No. Uh, no, no, no. I, I mean, the transformation is legit. You can't yeah, put these a, are real you, businesses. You can't say it's a bubble when actual people are saved. I was just talking to to the CEO of DocuSign. And he talked to a customer that saved two hundred and eighty million dollars mm. on one process mm. worldwide savings, guaranteed, quantified savings. I, I, I I mean, but I think that's kind of like what I'm seeing all across the board. That seems to be like the norm. It's like, you know, for the big companies, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, it cuts across so many different verticals. I mean, like I say, energy, health, on and on and on. Okay, we're getting the hook here, but I want to get your final okay. thoughts for the folks that are watching this interview that aren't here, that didn't experience in the moment like we're here live all day talking to little folks. What is this announcement all about? What is going on in Spark? Why is this, this event so huge? Why is the IBM, the community action, everything orbiting around Spark a big deal? Well, you know, Spark really makes it a lot simpler. And this is, this is work that needs to be done. We need to be smarter about how we use resources. We need to be smarter about how we answer to the bottom line. And I mean, everybody in business has this and Spark is making it a lot easier than the tooling that we had before. Paco Nathan here inside theCUBE. Thanks so much for your time and your insight for this big data conversation. This is theCUBE. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll be right back after this short break.